Welcome. This is the October 17th Beehive Production Users Call. We have Andrew, Patrick, Jan, Mark, Chris, and myself so far. And I don't know if anyone here was present for the remainder of the Enterprise Working Group call yesterday, but I was mildly surprised by the strong push for BVCP, a proprietary no source available Beehive Manager, which if I heard them correctly, fixed a few PCI pass-through issues, but there are no known patches related to those. Ed Mast was on the call, so hopefully he caught wind of all that. And if a listener out there catches that recording, maybe they can report on what indeed was there not available available there. Another strong endorsement was for highavailability.com, the, what is it, RSF1, I believe. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has used it. It's a I believe cross-platform ZFS-oriented high availability system. And I don't know if anything's available through CARP and other fully open tools. Mm -hmm. And between those two tools, they did recommend the open source Technitium DNS manager, which might need .NET, uh, as I recall from the conversation. And then MooseFS, which is has a very glitzy website at this point, but it does have very clear free BSD 64-bit and 32-bit downloads for 14, 13, and even maybe 12. So that was encouraging. So just there's the news. And I'm curious, has anyone present used any of those tools? No, but uh, nope. I've read um, reviews that MooseFS is one of those nice cluster file systems where you can dig yourself a giant uh, hole because all of the metadata goes through a centralized service and the moment that service stops scaling or you find out that you have a new workload which is more metadata heavy you're shit out of luck and all of your data is still available but just not at reasonable performance um, interesting the narrative was that to, it's the uh, least painful of the options like Gluster and stuff and friends. Because uh, <clears throat> the design choices they made make deployment easier and more okay. straightforward because you ha have a designated elected master metadata server, which is your one stop uh, metadata service. Uh, the problem is that, that you have to scale that up. You can't scale it out. Got it. So that said, and it's always uh, on path for lookups because I think per 64 megabyte block or so, you have to do a lookup. Okay. Well, uh, there was a very clear message that these are the feature sets to watch for. And if we can deliver those with fully upstream close to the OS tools, that would be great. Another piece of news last week, we talked about a jail management tool that is super friendly for TrueNAS core users and any FreeBSD user. And in the call, it was brought up that, well, that's a GPLv3 tool, but uh, Patrick reached out to the author and realized, hey, you know, maybe that's not the most optimal license for BSDs. And the author kindly relicensed it within a day or two or less. So Patrick, you also had some news on so XCPNG. Wait. Go ahead. Um. What did he relicense it to? I think it's BSD. BSD. Plus. Let's take a peek. Just okay. so it's more oh, it'll be a BSD friendly. Class. Let's verify that as a team with our countless witnesses watching the feed. So yeah, BSD3 just... class, boom, right there. Thanks for asking. Awesome. It's like, oh, let's not create a problem where there isn't one. That said, okay, where's my doc? There's my doc. Okay, so that's been promptly aligned with our reality. Uh, XEPNG, not quite open source. Okay, no updates, no patches. Do you have you, any other comments related to that? You you can install it for free. You need to register with them, and then you get a 15-day trial license for the management console, and only then can you install updates for the management console. And all in all, the experience was in no way feature parity with either VMware or TrueNAS. I mean, come on, I expect to be able to uh, configure LACP over a couple of network interfaces and then VLANs on top of that all through a flashy UI because TrueNAS already does that and VMware did it twice and but yeah. That but. isn't virtual machine management, that's host management. 
Of course, I expect host management from a product that claims to be appliance, eh? hypervisor. Okay, <laughs> if you want the product to not just be a beehive front end, but a, yeah. a VM hosting appliance, then you would criticism as well. I want, a, I, want a, I want an infrastructure management tool for hypervisor workloads. The reality is VMware is basically a full appliance. Yeah. Bare metal on up, yeah, and yeah, and again, exactly. We, we, we've been spoiled by TrueNAS, it really does more than much of the competition. And I don't quite get why IX Systems is not a bit more aggressive and a bit more supportive of the virtualization options and and the app ecosystem and everything because that really shines. Probably because they fail to uh, make a profit of it. Then why did they introduce it in the first place? I mean, yeah, because, they well, I don't and there's know. a difference I between what the head. there's a difference between what you intend to do and what you do. Okay. They introduced <laughs> it for the purpose of making a profit. It just didn't work. And it may also be that they had an internal need for that feature at the time. Sometimes just. If anyone's able to solve that here and now, great. Uh, I know there are various efforts to kind of pick up pieces, et cetera. Um, Godspeed. So moving on, Tara was uh, wondering if there are any updates on the digital ocean and Voltur uh, checksum offloading issues that many people have seen. Antrenig is not available to answer that today, but hopefully we'll get some clarification on that. Are there any uh, third-party cloud cl customers here who have seen such issues? No, but he already did a fairly uh, detailed <laughs> explanation of what he found with them. I think even in this call, maybe in slightly off topic in the jails call, mm -hmm. uh, the issue he discovered is that they falsely uh, claim that their hypervisor supports uh, checksum offloading so that which isn't an unreasonable claim if it works. Um, you kind of want your ZIO net device for your virtual, uh, virtual machines to support uh, checksum offloading, but in the, the way they deployed it, um, the host supposedly then thinks that they can offload the checksum calculation to the, the physical NIC of the virtual machine host, so running QEMO and K, uh, on KVM, and then what happens is that at the edge of the network, the checksum isn't calculated by hardware, so it's left uh, zeroed or FF, whatever. It's uh, under, it's an invalid checksum because everyone else thought someone else will handle the offloading. So it's offloaded and then sent without ever being hardware offloaded. <laughs> so it's a misconfiguration, supposedly. And the well, workaround is to uh, enable software checksumming or disable support for hardware checksumming. Then the virtual machine computes for checksums on the CPU and for the speeds you can reach on a small virtual machine and so on. It's normally not too terrible, but it is quite wasteful. And yeah. I'm searching the They're docs. They're not the only not the host with this problem, but I assume it's some kind of misconfiguration where um, the net network cards on the virtual machine hosts should handle this, but don't. And maybe they have disabled certain things in the network so that it even moves within the network, but at least over the internet, it's unusable because the just the frames get dropped at, at some router in the network. Well, yeah, no, no, no. What needs to be going on at that front from what I've seen is it needs to figure out when it can be done on the hardware, put it on, and do it on the hardware when it can, and then identify when it can't and do it in software when it can't. Yeah, the problem is how do you detect uh, a negative in that case without having some external trusted service to Paul, so sure, if you have some dial home feature like uh, um, 
I don't know, phone home dot freebsd dot org or something uh, built into the default uh, RC scripts. Sure, then you could have this kind of regression uh, control and automatically enable well, no, that. What I, I'm, Otherwise, not, I'm not saying that the that it, it I'm saying that it what needs to happen is it needs to be exposed as being to the to the guest OS as being uh, offload. It and is. Then I, let me finish. <laughs> and then when the emulation comes in, the emulation decides, okay, am I going to actually send this out a real card that will do the offload, which the uh, the the I'm sorry the um the OS itself should be mm -hmm. able to identify, or is it going to be used locally? In which case, it won't ever hit a real piece of hardware that's going to be able to do that offload. Yep. Now the idea behind this is, among others, that you don't have to do checksumming for a VM to VM communication within the host. So basically everyone just claims the checksum was hardware validated for offloading and it's never computed if a frame doesn't leave uh, the host, um, which is what is supposed to happen in, because uh, they trust the local memory not to corrupt. Um, so that the, the idea is that you don't have to do uh, checksum computation of the IP packets or TCP and UDP packets uh, on a um, on a yeah on a flow which doesn't leave the virtual machine host. Um, the problem is that they don't do that when it really leaves it, and that's just a misconfiguration uh, on the provider side, which is falsely blamed uh, on FreeBSD, which is just the supposedly uh, innocent victim of a common misconfiguration, which has been observed on a few other hosts, which have not been enumerated. So by definition, you've described the most simplest of routing, like, hey, I'm on the same system or I'm headed out of this system. Could some kind of dynamic decision be made or is it, it is there no, a full mix um, bring up and tear down, tear down, bring up? machine is not supposed to care about this. Oh, no, but <laughs> here we are. And you don't want to frequently reconfigure the VNet for every frame, I suppose. No, you I don't. Assume but... just the exit to reconfigure the NIC <laughs> into offloading on and off is uh, slower than actually doing the checksumming. Hmm. Uh, if you have a mix of flows and you can't patch them up. So you shouldn't have to work around this. You just disable the checksum offloading on a broken hooster, this uh, system. Then you pay the CPU overhead. Is there a <laughs> you... so super simple test a user could execute at whatever level of the stack to verify if they have proper yeah, offload the, handling the... or not? A sniff to say, hey, yes, there be dragons. Yes, you can get it to the console and run TCP down, but you send out traffic and see that IPerf doesn't go out to the target, but. Uh, if you disable checksum offloading, it suddenly works, then yeah, that's an easy well, smoke test. Uh, the problem is that every user discovers this issue on their own and loses uh, time and patience. Okay, so if you uh, went to Wonderhost 2000, a new provider that showed up in Berlin mm -hmm. with amazing connectivity and you wanted to test it fit, uh, will behave properly with hardware checksum offloading, what would you sit down and do? I, I would. Go because your job the, depends uh, on it. Management console interface, yeah. open the system console, log into the virtual machine, because I can't trust the assume. So if I don't have any issues and networking performs as normal, there's nothing to investigate because this has such a massive impact because networking is basically unusable for TCP and UDP, hmm. at least. Um, so that means that 99 point something percent of all things are broken. Um, so at that point, I would look into the console. If I have the suspicion that it, this is it, I would uh, disable it and see if suddenly SSH is usable and I can install iPerf and get the performance I expect. 
So, so disable the offloading if it's currently <clears throat> active and then yeah. try it both ways. Yeah, okay. and, I will, and I may want to try and check to disable only the direction uh, that's broken if one direction works. So I would maybe try disable everything and then re-enable one, then the other, and find out which of the two is broken or if both are broken, receive and transmit. That's um, easy to do, but- Does everyone agree with uh, Jan in that It's assessment? a horrible mess no. to have to do that. Of course, well, the computers were involved, so it's going to be, you know, kind of horrible. <laughs> Any other thoughts there, tests to try, because this keeps coming up, and if it needs to be just FAQ question number one, hey, you might have offloading issues, here's how to test for it, so you do not have pain and suffering for months to come, do this oh, first. you won't, <laughs> uh, in this this case, is such a, a extreme breakage that the system is unusable with it. Okay, should be obvious. And this would be through an, a management console where you're not cut off by is, doing it. As, so I would be surprised if you ever get an SSH connection to such a system. Okay, so you'd lock yourself out maybe in the testing. No, you process. start locked out. Okay. You never work. Yeah, you never, never get it. Yep. Exactly. It, it's not it, some it kind does, of it, problem where for, there's a problem. For me at Vulture, it does work well enough to be able to do interactive work. I mean, typing into SSH and stuff works. Yeah. But okay. I'm, using my, I'm using my Vulture VM as a WireGuard endpoint uh, to circumvent geoblocking. And the VPN performance is abysmal. That's what Will let it me. Would be the TCP. Or... Let him finish. Uh, yeah, so you it. have. A twenty percent functionality, and then when it comes to the task at hand, it falls over. You have one percent performance or something like that. Okay. So it's a couple. It's, it's not even in the in the order of, of megabytes per second. It's a couple of k per second, which is enough for interactively typing into SSH. Okay, got it. Small, Thank you. Small small packets and everything, so not, not a big problem. Got it. So yeah, that sounds like. The moment you hit some kind of thresholding to trigger the offloading, it breaks. And because SSA, um, sorry, TCP then just applies lots of back pressure and packet pacing, it may want once in a while work, but yeah. Well, it's which raises the and, question how to test that threshold? Because if you can, if it looks like it's working, you say, hey, boss, yeah, I can SSH it. No, no, yep. you, just, you just run an IPerf. Okay. You run, run IPerf 3, and if we get figures in the, in the in the kilobyte range then networking is broken because we Got have it. 2024 and nobody expects kilobytes per second yep. networking not, not on even a, in a five dollar per month plan on a Perfect. cheap one or two core vm you should still get hundreds of megabits of throughput yep. yep. big packets. Agreed. No, agree and... completely i just want to spell this out so we never hear this topic again <laughs> no we will hear about it again that's the annoying issue because Every new user will run into this. And yeah. that's why the only yeah. way to hide this kind of breakage would be if they provide a pre uh, configured uh, FreeBSD install image, which uh, always or uh, just a VM image to deploy or something, so yeah. that it always applies by default that stuff with a big warning box in rc.conf to not remove that. Yep. Yep. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a problem neither FreeBSD nor uh, the users really can fix. You can only yell at your hoster, and on these budget hosters, uh, you can uh, realistically speaking yell at a, a ticketing system. So, so uh, good luck. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Uh, uh, yell at the ticketing. Okay, that said, uh, Patrick, you found a post from what yesterday on a somewhat old 13 host where Beehive might be hemorrhaging RAM. Was that yeah, just that, something you've they reached out to you or you just bumped into it? I know that that guy showed up on the previous virtualization mailing list that yeah. was kind of asked to open a PR. <laughs> yeah. uh, he opened a PR on uh, October 15th. Oh, wait a minute. That okay, that's new. Just just a second. We'll never really get I should end. take this. Just one second. Yes. This is not as old as I feared it was. 
For the, some the, reason, I, the, for the some reason, on, I think there is a dupe because I, I have on the mailing list. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, are the you talking about discussion this discussion was a couple issue? of weeks ago, and I, I wonder if anyone has ever heard of that problem. Um. You were saying. My question would be, what is, uh, yeah. so, um, so they're running a jellyfin beehive guest uh, on Druna's core, as one commonly does. And it the, the eventually is blows the up. The, the VM is configured with eight gigs of memory, and it consumes fourteen at the moment. Though, what do this person? Is. Wait, um, I don't think. Uh, wait, memory unit and current memory. What is the memory uh, with unit? Scroll, scroll up uh, again. Kilobytes. Okay, that's yeah. That looks like eight gig. But why is current memory and memory? What's this duplication? The virtual size and the, the resident size of the memory. So that's that's for you know, uh, in the configuration uh, under description, the next two lines. Yeah. Why is the memory size specified twice? No idea because TrueNAS does that. Did they make any mention of this being TrueNAS in the report? Yep. Is it? Oh, TrueNAS 13. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so you, use the, you use the UI to configure a VM. You configure the memory that you want to allocate. Okay. And then the XML is generated by the TrueNAS middleware. There's a link to the schema. Maybe we, and the link is broken. Great. Um, I've, I've never really? worked with, with Libvirt outside of TrueNAS. So Jeez. sorry about that. No clue. Interesting. Bring it to your attention. Yeah. Uh, uh, how's that? TrueNAS 14.1 coming. I don't know. It's TrueNAS 13.3. You wrote that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yes, a, a antique, increasingly antique piece of software. It's okay. the uh, latest bear. Duly noted. Okay, even the example configs have this duplication. Okay. Uh, so even here, yeah, the problem maybe that um, TrueNAS applied some patches to Beehive, at least to the user space process, so that could be part of a problem. Mm. So what I would try is to take the closest FreeBSD release uh, and try to recreate the configuration. Uh, I'm hoping we didn't patch any direct libvirt support in, but are running libvirt through the normal tools available in ports. So if you really want to reproduce this as closely as possible on FreeBSD, you would have to take 13.3 or maybe 13.4 um, and try again. Question for you. If mm -hmm. they've worked on the VNC uh, components and they happen to have a memory leak, would they show up under the Beehive process? Mark might have yes. some insights in that. If it's it's uh, shared, it's linked into it. So yes, you Just see what I'm library. where I'm headed with. It's like maybe Beehive itself is not to blame, but uh, something well, like the UEFI payload is Beehive. hemorrhaging memory. Um, it is Beehive. It's a Beehive still. process. Uh, it's just a patch okay. to the Beehive uh, process. <laughs> that yeah, oh, to Beehive the source code they applied to add the custom VNC support. But it's uh, premature to blame it on exactly that because. Oh, I'm not I'm saying, but maybe VNC we're looking in the wrong place. We run the risk of memory uh, over time because normally you don't stay connected indefinitely to a Jellyfin server. So sure. uh, yeah, I can't see the it uh, just randomly gobbling up uh, memory without any client connected and that being discovered now. Because normally the kind of thing would explode in a lot of people's faces uh, and not some. <laughs> yep. 
one now uh, yes yeah and mm. so well, I, well, I'm, I'm yes, gonna interject that there there are a lot of unknowns with respect to this bug report that it would be nice to have more discrete steps to reproduce and mm -hmm. if they can reproduce on dash current as opposed to true NAS, that would be much better would someone like yep. to chime in on this report with those questions? Like, hey, could you? Well, if they're a TrueNAS user, there's a good chance they've never installed FreeBSD in their life, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say dash current is probably essential. Yeah. Why dash current, not a production release? For fixing it, okay, but to reproduce, it should just, I would try to pick the closest still supported release and reproduce it and then try the newest uh, supported production release, try there that has been fixed and if so ask for a backboard and if not, then you go on current and yeah, but it's yeah, a lot of task of a new user. Okay. Chris, still with us, would you like to update us on your vision for VM State D? Great. So um, basically, I'm wondering whether it makes sense to basically take a step back and make VM State D more generic in terms of not just managing Beehive, but let's say have a more broader configuration um, that still works the same way as before with hooks, but allows us to not just uh, manage uh, Beehive processes, but any kind of processes that we would like to watch and do something when they uh, start, stop, and so on and so forth. And I've got a couple of diagrams that I can probably share and I've got some I sample configuration that I just that need makes to a lot of sense. find where I want to start. Hold on a second. Um, where do we start with? Let's start with this one. So Could this be um, plus plus. Um, okay, this is ahead. where this is where I started with. Hold on a second. Share screen. How do I do this? Oh right now I um where do I go with this? I start with this one. So, um, coming back to the to the to the hook scripts. Um, basically, I was borrowing a page out of Rod's book, who actually suggested that I should be thinking about the RC system. Uh, and with the RC system, we have you know uh, a script system with let's say common arguments that we run things with start, stop, pre-start, pre-stop. There, there's a couple of let's say usual things that we would see in our C scripts, right? And um, with that, I figured um, if I tie into that, I would potentially simplify things. I mean, the samples that I have are still focused on BF, but in theory, obviously this would or should still work with any kind of other process as well, not just Beehive. And um, this also kind of brought me to the idea that it would probably make sense to have, let's say, some variables, some environment variables that could potentially be injected into those scripts and whatever additional environment variables come out of those scripts might actually go back into the process monitor to hand those variables further to other hook scripts to, um, let's say, make more complicated things and also allow me to for example, set up a tap device, let's say in one hook script, um, and the particular information, what uh, what tap interface was created would then allow me actually to, let's say, use that information elsewhere. For example, I've got this other, um, 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 where do I, uh, here it is, uh, new share, hold on a second, I wanna show you something else, what I mean with this, it's this basically, so the idea would be um, I export a variable um, in the RC script to say I, I've got I've got this tap interface now, and then I could actually use that tap interface name in the, for example, the call to the to the daemon that I'm starting. Um, mm -hmm. 
so that that was kind of where I was coming from because I figured, okay, the the structure that I was going down with VM state D was something that I think already Jan predicted that I would be running into the problem that I'm gonna end up with a configuration file that tries to chase whatever configuration structure and options Beehive has. So with every iteration of Beehive, I would be you know chasing after that and having to figure out how it I can make that fit into my configuration. And this way I would kind of just you know alleviate and um, alleviate the situation and rid myself of having to chase everything. And um, what, um, let me show you something else here really quickly. What I then tried out, and this is all just, you know, theory, but basically I figured, okay, if I, if I um, go back to this UCL file structure that we've been looking at back and forth now, I was figuring, okay, this there there would be all sorts of new opportunities when I redo this. Basically, having let's say templates where I can do just uh, some simplified um, structural things, um, and then I could reuse whatever I have in templates with additional variables that go back and forth between the hook scripts and the uh, and this monitor, and um, and I could define what kind of um, sub uh, calls would go into the hooks, for example, is it pre-start, is it stop, is it pre-stop, post-stop, whatever it is. I basically find what kind of scripts I want to call. They would not have to be called thematically, obviously, so I can use, I don't know, pre-start on one script, but I don't have to use pre-stop on, on it. So I, I just define what kind of hooks I want to use at, one, at, at what um, event stage, let's say. Um, I could define what it should do um, in terms of exit codes uh, when whatever process is being monitored when it exits. Um, though probably this way of defining the exit code is probably not the best and smartest way. Maybe there's better ways, but um, I figured I would either restart, I would either um, exit or, or yeah, I, I, I would just error out if I see a particular exit code. And uh, yeah, those settings are probably also um, rather straightforward, but um, here we can also see um, the variables that I meant. Yeah, if, if a hook script returns or exports an environment variable with tap tap, I would just reuse that here. Um, as a program argument, I could use the counter um, that increments automatically whenever I um, I use that variable within the UCL. Um, then again, and here I am. Jan has experienced a whole lot other stuff and has uh, experimented with UCL and and, and uh, lib UCL. So I'm wondering maybe there's even smarter ways of doing this with the um, onboard, uh, let's say, functionalities because these kinds of variables, obviously, I would have to parse them myself. I would have to program the handling, so it, it would become uh, a lot more complicated, probably. Yeah. Yeah, Jan, so please go ahead. If you have a defined. Um... A uh, UCL variable uh, accessing it is not hookable. Uh, you, mm -hmm. but if it's undefined, uh, which means you have to use a long form in uh, curly braces, so that it, then uh, you can access an undefined variable and hook basically the lookup uh, error and mm -hmm. do something. But uh, the better way would be to register a custom dot counter macro, mm -hmm. uh, which you then just expand. Okay. Uh, so do, you, do you have, do you have okay. any kind of sample code for the stuff that you've tried out with yep. UCL? Because, okay, I would very much appreciate that if you could share that because um, obviously um, I would, I would, I would love to, you know, save myself the, the, the rabbit hole of having to deal with, you know, the, um, mm -hmm. let's say um, the issues that might be lurking in lip UCL because um, yeah. So, uh, in my opinion, the best way to do it would be to use a macro to right. basically read the counter mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then not either assign the, if you need it more than once, assign it to a variable mm -hmm. so that you would have basically read counter. And then because you may want to have more than one counter, you basically have lint counters. Mm -hmm. And then let's say, uh, read counter uh, interface and then assign it to tap index or something mm -hmm. and you can use that variable to both uh, create the tap interface and uh, bring it up and add it to a bridge or something mm -hmm. 
Um, you have to think about how you want to do that, uh, but it's possible. And um, what about what about the? Um, do I have an example here somewhere? Right here. But regarding um, your um, exit code handling. Yeah. Uh, I think um, the Demon Tools family of service supervisors, um, mm. especially S six, have a cleaner solution for that. And that mm -hmm. is that uh, instead of you defining all the um, steps in your state machine, the state machine is predefined, but you get to define what happens in the certain step. And there's a step called uh, finished, or right. finish, which um, means that you have for something like Beehive, which is a long running process staying kindly in the foreground. Mm -hmm. You run Beehive, it exits for whatever reason. The supervisor gets a sick child, collects the status, uh, reads the zombie, and then uh, it runs a finish script, which is uh, expected to finish within a fairly tight deadline. Um, and that gets as arguments the process ID, the exit code, uh, the signal number, and maybe even the uh, process group so that it can kill the rest of the process group. And basically, you delegate the decision into a finished script, which is expected to run within uh -huh. a, a few milliseconds in normal operation, but quickly in human terms. Okay. And then it doesn't mean that it wouldn't consume some kind of configuration. Uh, for example, it would make sense to have a template to have a mapping from uh, exit code to uh, maybe restart, uh, disabled, or tear down or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the question, especially for something like Beehive, is how much logic do you want to expose uh, to such a service manager? Because that's, in my opinion, what you're describing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want, for example, to have the um, tap interface question and so on? exposed as their own services, which is what I'm doing with a uh, six RC. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to do it what I previously did with run it and just um, have a long startup script uh, just imperatively in the long shell script handle all of that. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the better cleaner uh, solution is to have a system which is expressive enough that you can break that out and have dependencies so that just because you restart the uh, BF guest, its run script doesn't have to either be written in such a way that it impotently works out what is already set up, uh, but instead you can just have little yeah, unit services, whatever you want to call them, you tear down and up and um, the dependencies between them express what you really want to happen. Mm. So they, you would have a collection of services, um, which is uh, your guest is up is basically the thing you, the user cares about. But it would mm. internally consist out of creating a tap interface, um, putting it on a bridge, um, right, right, making, right, right. Yeah. and on the startup it would have. If your system can express that, a negative depends basically make sure the VMM device is gone before I start so that you start with a clean VM state and something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this is this is where RC, where your RC approach with, um, um, what's it called, RCS6 or what was it called? Um, uh, 6RC, thank you, um, is definitely. Um, is definitely shining in comparison to what I'm mm -hmm. doing because th there is no dependencies or anything in here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not about it's not about the state of whatever the hook script is doing. So, you're you're um, mm -hmm. one would actually have to program that, I suppose. So you're you're making a good point there. For um, and the other thing is, what state do you want to be observable? Mm -hmm. if one of the choices which limits as six RC the offer intentionally made is that he refused to uh, implement a message broker of any sort. Uh -huh. So if you want to have many to 
uh, one too many notifications on a Unix system, there is especially reliable ones, there isn't a good way to do that without a, a broker daemon. That broker daemon doesn't have to be complex, it can be very simple uh, compared to most things, but it has to run and it's a chicken mm. neck problem if you're yeah. truly the real init system. Um, something like uh, system B uh, solves for some definition of solve the problem by putting an unconscionable amount of code and logic into the uh, real init process, but even they uh, struggle with uh, dependencies on dbus because so much of the uh, um, higher level crap like uh, the network setup and so on depends indirectly at least on dbus so that they have like a minimal dbus broker re-implementation inside of system d to use before the real one is up and running and uh, or they have to special case things so that if just if we are past the uh, Real debus broker being up, use that. Otherwise, use this fallback mechanism, which is really not what you want to do. Uh, it's ugly. It's a lot of duplicated work, and yeah. And what so, a six avoids all of that uh, pain by not depending on that. The downside is that you don't have all the niceties of uh, a real message broker, mm. but. If you are not insisting on, on bootstrapping from nothing, uh, or you're willing to use um, basically your own custom, it wouldn't be better to have a like a, a service management um, message broker, which would be fairly simple and um, wouldn't have to even be configurable if it's. Is the only way to subscribe to notifications. Um, as long as you have only trusted clients and you're fine with if they fail, you kicking them off the bus, uh, that also works. Um, yeah, otherwise, you run into deadlocks uh, if you queue messages uh, and run out of memory. Um, but yeah, that's going really into the weeds. As uh, Michael asked, yes, uh, MQTT would work but it's quite heavyweight even despite being a lightweight protocol for what's really needed here and yeah, sure you could just say i need a local mosquito broker and i use i think mosquito even supports unix sockets so you wouldn't even have to expose it to the real network and then it would be really nice because you could make all of the mqtt service your interface to the service manager and everything is API first. And you could easily uh, hook that in. And if you design your namespace in such a way that you can nest it, uh, you could then have some proxy, which Mosquito, for example, can do. And you could have uh, basically a single full water, which acts as your proxy to address all of your uh, hosts. And there you have your clustered API with one MQTT a gateway into your whole uh, service cluster. Sure, it will to totally work. Um, I wouldn't really feel comfortable depending on that for system stuff, but for high level service managing if I'm a VM host, yeah, why not? What's the Mosquito license? Mosquito is a... Mosquito. Uh, is it Apache? Is it GPL? I don't know. You know. It's Eclipse Foundation, so it could be. Oh, here we go. GitHub repo. I found it. Um, uh, what <laughs> license is it? It is view license. It's a view license license. Let's EPL see. Um, what? E Eclipse, Eclipse public, public, license. public license too. Okay. I'm not familiar with the details of that license. <laughs> Uh, Chris, do you have more to share? Um, well, yes. Um, sure. The, I mean, the, before before I move on, I'm. Um, I also want to ask Jan what his take is in terms of. Um, I, I'm not sure if my point came across with the sample here. Um, I sort of thought about you know having having templates that um, that are user definable, 
with, let's mm -hmm. say, um, typical parameters, and then one could actually overwrite that um, when you yep. have an example down here. Um, we actually overwrite the values. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I believe something like that is kind of out of the, that's kind of out of the box stuff that you can do with UCL, or is it not? Not directly. You could do it maybe with includes, but right. you would have to write at least a custom macro or application right. logic to invoke in between the parsing steps to right. change the variables. But it's totally okay. doable. Uh, I've done it. It works. Um, because there are basically two kinds of, unless you want to add conditional uh, code execution or parsing well, yeah. uh, to uh, UCL, uh, then you can either have these kind of templates where you're only binding variables. Uh -huh. um, or um, what I'm thinking about for my friendly uh, front end for a six is to do that as the simple case and for the more complex case to just have scripts which emit uh, UCL to stand uh -huh. out as template and then you they read their uh, arguments, serialize this JSON, and they emit the, so that you have kind of output generators for the total flexibility at load time. Mm -hmm. um, but with the caveat that most users are not expected to do that. Mm. I'm that wondering, you, you, you mentioned recently that uh, you're basically um, building something that takes a UCL file and converts that to um, a 6RC, right? Yes, with some um, macro expansion and a quality of life feature so that you can have reverse dependencies and so on. And uh, how do you, how do you is... sorry, how, how, do you, how do you deal with, um, let's say, the, um, is there any kind of degree of abstraction of the Beehive configuration? Um, in your configuration, or do you just mine? None at yeah. all, because uh, I am my work, I, experiment is or is not in any way Beehive specific. All right. Um, so there is nothing Beehive specific in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can really give structured arguments to templates, and the template could expand that in a. Uh, into a Beehive configuration, for example, mm. because the Beehive configuration is fairly simple and straightforward, and it would be easy to have the yeah. So for my uh, kind of uh, text level uh, UCL templating, what I'm thinking about is that I want to have um, the UCL snippet, which is just passed and then emitted and passed again with more variables in scope, because if the variable is undefined, which basically all are in, by default, uh, there are just two default variables in the UCL parser um, mm -hmm. for the file and directory. And if um, the other variables are unknown, they are just preserved as is. Mm -hmm. And then I can take the past configuration uh, emit it back into a string, um, take the arguments to the template, validate them with the built-in schema parser, fill in any uh, missing values from default values, so that I have an object with default values, one with the schema for the actual arguments, and one with the template content. And then I, if the after inserting the defaults, the, the arguments pass a schema validation, then it binds those as variables, and with those variables in scope, passes the, um, the emitted text again. That's not perfect, but it's easy to implement, That's, mm -hmm. and it's fairly easy to use. Uh, and you can get the only problem is that the schema validator doesn't emit great uh, error messages for misconfigurations. For basic things, it's good enough, I think, for uh, more complex nested structures with multiple op uh, options, where then busy it has to backtrack a lot during schema validation. It, can be uh, kind of meaningless that it says, yeah, no option matching, bam. But 
for uh, the template arguments, I expect that it's mostly a flat key value mapping. So where the default validator provides good enough error messages and tells you that, uh, sorry, this uh, key in this object does not match uh, this regular expression or something, or this integer uh, must be in this range, or this has to be this type, let's say integer, but it's a float or something. Uh, so yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, because I'm doing this uh, at the textual level, uh, the advantage is that you can have a template which expands into multiple services. So you could have a template for a Beehive VM which expands in the interface creation, the Beehive process stuff, the storage stuff, and then all of that collected up in a bundle so that you can start it as a group with, and then depend another VM on the whole bundle. Well, yeah. um, let, let me let me um, let me ask you because while I was preparing all that, you know, and and to you know structure things in my mind, I was also thinking about the, the approach that that uh, you told me about uh, with with uh, or your experiment with this S6RC, and I'm out coming out of your BSD con with my um, putting Beehive into jail. Um, I began to wonder mm -hmm. whether I mean at the end of the day. All the stuff that I prepared here with, you know, having UCL, if you, if you really boil it down, you could just, you know, have a jail conf and yes, and encapsulate everything into a jail. And now I'm wondering, are you looking at also, let's say, placing your S6RC into, let's say, one jail? Because then I suppose you could keep things separate from the base mm -hmm. and still have S6RC as a as the main driver, right? Within um, the jail? The right, in the jail, that, yeah. Yes, you can do that. Um, been there, done that. Um, <laughs> okay. The nice thing about S6RC is that um, it does not have to replace the init system, even if it right. can. Right. So you can, the, the way I found which gets you basically all of the reliability guarantees of having a recursive supervision tree where basically the supervisor is implicitly uh, by default if you truly commit to s6 it's uh, its supervision works like this you have a directory with all your supervised services the directory is supervised by the let's call it super supervisor and so that one uh, is your init process and all it does is it scans uh, the directory on startup for some links to other directories and each of these subdirectories is one long running service. And because of that, it's basically only responsible for starting a client in each subdirectory, oh, sorry, a client, a child process in each. And before you worry about overhead, these are tiny processes in the few kilobyte range. Uh, per process, and most of that is read only code mappings still. So, this isn't going to hurt any system which can boot free BSD. And the uh, system okay, is I, implicitly I... reliable because if the init process pit one crashes, the whole system crashes, uh, so that you can never lose your root supervisor. Well, you can't get jump... that unless you're pit one, but the next best thing is to just write it in etc tty so that the normal init process will restart it just like a get tty or xdm brief question yeah brief question mm -hmm. um when we think about a jail structure obviously i imagine you can replace and uh, replace i mean you can have a 6rc as the main process being started in the jail right and i'm, I'm asking the question is, do you want that well I suppose yes, because here is my follow-up question. The stuff that I've been using in EuroBSDCon was hierarchical jails where Beehive is actually running in a sub-jail within a jail. So now I'm 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 wondering about you know having having a jail where actually all the uh the virtual machines actually mm -hmm. run as sub-jails. And I That's... suppose those could then be managed with S6RC as the main thing, could it not? Mm -hmm. Or Sure, um, you could could it do it like that. That would totally work. The problem is that there are some things you want to do 
workforce creating subjects and so on, right. which um, if you want to use the full jail uh, security boundary between the child jails of your right. uh, root of, of your beehive parent jail, mm. there are some things you can't do inside that jail. For example, right. you can't load the uh, custom uh, DevFS uh, rule sets that can only be done on the real host. Because you probably want to have the custom right. uh, DevFS rule set per guest, which only exposes the devices like that exact tab and the sim link to it, and that VMM device and VMM IO device, and so on. So that the uh, mm. if you really want to have the jail as a security boundary, so that the different uh, sub jails cannot attack each other uh, by accessing devices they're not supposed to uh, access. Right. It's, you also can't you delegate could say CFS. That's yeah. Not mm. necessary because Beehive itself is capsicumized, so that once it's open, but it still opens you up to not attacks, but at the very least misconfiguration. But let's say you have two virtual machines and both of them use the same uh, writable disk image. Uh -huh. That would uh, be a misconfiguration, but it would also be a, a big issue because it potentially, unless you have something like ZFS detecting double import, it would uh, just shred your guest data. I mean, it's nothing jail specific. It would happen the same way if you do it uh, <laughs> without a jail in between. Uh -huh. um, so it's just that you're not improving the state of the art, not that it uh -huh. uh, would be terrible to do. Um, so some things would have to run on the real host, um, but there's nothing run, wrong with running a 6 C on the real host and using then basically a 6 c to run jail commands. So really mm -hmm. the command. Yeah, jail. yeah. And then you, the question is what are the kind of problem is that now you have the jail.conf uh, system. If you, unless you're going back to the old pre jail.conf invocation of jail, which is the supported. Um, then you have the problem that the, now the jail.conf state machine engine is fighting your outer state machine engine because uh, the normal assumption, uh, as we mentioned uh, months and months ago and uh, Jared's call, is that there's a lifetime mismatch between the jail, the jail command, and the jail in the kernel normally if you have a um, unfairable jail because normally, unless you're doing it the Linux container way, uh, jails are started. The jail command runs through its state machine, like repair, uh, pre-start, created, um, start. Oh. And then the start runs something like the normal RC scripts in the jail and runs to completion, and then your jail is ready. And for such a supervisor, that doesn't really work, but you can write a jail.conf which um, does the following. It either you have one uh, with only the hooks enabled you want per stage, so that you have a jail.conf for the jail and you just run the jail command basically with creating so far that it doesn't have the start scripts in it, mm -hmm. so that exec.start is undefined. Uh, you run that on a persistent jail. So the jail is configured to be persistent. Then you run a jail uh, conf with the exec uh, dot start set and maybe post start. Um, no, post that doesn't really make sense at this point here. So, and then you write an exec dot start, which stays in the foreground. But in my opinion, a better way to do it would be to, uh, if you have such a supervisor to run a J exec, on a persistent jail to do the equivalent of the start action, because otherwise the um, jail command stays in the way and uh, interferes as a um, on with signal delivery and so on. So the service manager cannot re easily reliably signal 
the jail process in that case and receive a sick child when it exits. It only does this indirectly through the jail command, the exit that the jail command is expected to exit when the exit.start exits. Uh, but you cannot, for example, send a, something like sick hub or something to the jail process through the jail command. Um, so you would have to do a bit of surgery on your jail.conf or something. But if you template that out, that's doable uh, to split it up into basically a, there's a, in 15 current, I think Jamie committed my request so that you have a, the option of uh, running only the cleanup steps on a jail because one of the problems is if the jail is garbage collected because it's emferral and the last process died, mm. the kernel will garbage collect the jail inside the kernel. It mm. will go into dying state and then be cleaned up when there's no nothing depending on it. But mm. for example, the mount points like def and uh, def fd aren't unmounted, which normally blocks. Um, uh, sorry, Andrew, do you have any topics uh, we can pull you for in and Keep going. get a word in? Uh, I'm sure he'll jump in. Um, so the problem is that uh, that normally blocks you from restarting the jail. You can write in prepare or pre-start a hook to uh, unmount the blocking mount points before the jail command tries to mount them again. Because the normal way to mount file systems through the jail.conf isn't clever enough to do it through the uh, right typing an uh, fs tab into the mount command, but instead just does the mounting or an fs tab per, per line basically instead of the whole. So it doesn't use the auto mount logic in the mount command, which is why things break. Um, um, I just fix that by having a early hook unmount everything mounted under the jail and then mount it up again. That doesn't waste a lot of time because you don't expect to that frequently start a jail that you notice. And the, yeah. Um, that is all solvable, but it has to be solved. And yeah. So now you have the, the it at a point where you basically run the one jail command invocation to uh, create an empty persistent jail. Then you run, uh, you, um, sorry, what? Uh, you basically run uh, the equivalent of the exec.start under supervision. Uh, and that is a, you expect to be long running and then when it exits, you just like any other long running, you have the cleanup handler and shutdown stuff. Uh, so yeah, maybe it would be because it looks like you're re basically reinventing the wheel uh, because yeah, a lot exactly. of the things you're describing look like that. that that's exactly what I start to realize. To yeah. a 6RC, which is yeah, exactly. understandable because you're trying to solve <laughs> yeah. a very similar problem, if not basically yeah. the same problem. I, 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 I realize going down yeah, sorry. Uh, the same rabbit hole I ran down years exactly, ago. And, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. The thing is that I, yeah. it really uh, helps to read and make yourself familiar with prior art instead of, mm. because then you understand basically what can be done, what has been done, and the consequences. Mm. Um, I, I, I realize I need to check out S6RC in more detail. I'm, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that out the with the jail, is, I think. Yep, well, S6RC is a service manager that it's really, in my opinion, the best description is correct to a fault. So you can't take shortcuts. Yeah. Uh, because it will just say, uh, basically, nope, that configuration does not compile. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have this uh, missing dependency or something. Um, yeah, which in a lot of ways is what you want, but it means that the learning curve is high. And the other problem is that there's no there's the introductory text. There's only man page style uh, reference documentation and a little bit of white paper like documentation. There's no tutorial style documentation on it that I am familiar with. 
um, which means that you will look at the documentation, which is online, and read it and think, yeah, but so what? What does what's that supposed to mean? Um, True story. Yeah. And yeah. The more you read, the less you'll understand. You, Chris, you have another exactly, diagram uh, for us? You will feel like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, let me uh, just, uh, hold on a second. I've got this diagram. I can, I can shock you with that as well. Hold on a second. <laughs> Um, it's just going to show how complicated things got when I um, when I screwed around. If you know, I um, okay, I speed things up. Where is just my... put that window on full screen so that I can yeah, read your diagram. Um, here it is. One um, of the screens. Share. Um, that's it, I think. So let's just say things Ooh, turn wow. a little bit more complicated. I, would, I mean, the state, the states were really fairly simple, but then I, I went into, okay, what do I need and how are things operating with each other? How, I mean, it's like aliens, you know, it's like <laughs> just no, one second not, to the give next. Give me a it's second, like, please, to uh, have to. Yeah, I can, I can, I can post it in a minute. Uh, seriously, I think, no, uh, what I, I mean, think we can, we can skip that because I, uh, out of, out of our conversation, I realized absolutely what you said. Yeah. I need I need to first you know I need to take a closer look at the demon at the demon code I need to take a look at six uh, or C to better understand what it's doing already. Yeah, I should not. I should code not. is a bit um, annoying okay. to read. <laughs> okay. Great. As in, well, um, it's not going to be better than mine, I think. <laughs> um. Yeah. And I have a really uh, good idea as what to look at is uh, which is part of S six. The mm. lower half of the S6, S6, RC pairing okay. is the S6 sudo command, which is All a right. set UID less sudo. Hmm. Uh, it works by having a process already running as the intended user listening on a Unix socket, and then you ah. connect to that, it validates okay. it. And so it does. Maybe it's uh, yeah, it's just command invocation as a service. Yeah, but this that, pattern is uh, it, something you kind of want to look at. It's okay. Uh, apparently, apparently, um, let's say one one of the experiences that I have with VM State D is you know you start programming a a, a process watcher and eventually you start. <laughs> this at least what happened to me. Suddenly I'm suddenly I'm coding stuff that um that is usually done by Tmux. <laughs> and um, oh, this is not what, yeah, like, you know, making consoles available and, and, and mm -hmm. sharing those with this. <laughs> Suddenly you code stuff that you're actually not set out to code. And uh, that's why yep. I stopped and figured, okay, let's take a step back here. Um, yes. And yet, yet I managed to, you know, find the next rabbit hole to, you know, to really dig into that. Um, so oh. I, I really appreciate the input. It's, um, <laughs> it's a reality check, let's say. So, um, yeah, maybe we should just do one on one call and walk through the uh, snippets I have flying around, mm -hmm. which you may want to look at. Uh, yeah, Ed, because I have lots of unfinished ideas, uh, which yeah, I same here. Same, <laughs> hmm? same here. Same here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, uh. But uh, most of them got to the point where. I answered my research question and then mm. I moved on. Yeah, okay. So it's probably code which is useful for looking at and understanding one aspect of the mm. design space, but not something you can just run and use as a ready to use thing. Mm. So, uh, oh, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate the input really. Uh. So, um, what I have here is a Example, da -da -da um, okay. Um, what, uh, uh, pro do you have tip. a real to real tape machine in the back? Wait, what? Um, oh, is that just Sorry. a static background? No, that's, uh, um, that, that's, okay. a, that's, a, <laughs> that's just, um, yeah, it would be nice to have that in the background. It's a deck PDPA. Yeah, it yeah, uh, looks like exactly old PDP gear or clone it thereof, is. and that's why I was surprised which lab you're in. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, I would love uh, to sit well, there, but unfortunately, no. Uh, 
Do you know that uh, this week, upcoming weekend there's uh, the Vintage Computing Festival Berlin? Oh, right, okay. Uh, well, yep. That sounds um, like fun. ECFP, yep. So, um, that's why I'm. So, uh, I know it's probably too late <laughs> to bring it up. And um, so, uh, let's, uh, Marco. Do How we about have any you other two topics? connect? Well, yeah. You, keep in mind, pro tip: the Beehive channel is always open. You might run into me on a meeting, right. but not very often. So, if you want to just hop in, do it. Yep. I say we say, say thank you to the nice people. Yep. And uh, call it a day for now. But you are both very welcome to <clears throat> move on together in Deutsch. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I'm going to call it at. 1822 chris we've been missing you would you like the honors yeah. oh my god um like and subscribe <laughs> there you go great thank you everyone i will catch you next week mm -hmm.